Well, hello, I'm Wendy Burton. I'm a GP from Brisbane, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Kerry McMahon, radiologist from Queensland X-Ray. Kerry, today I'd like us to talk about antenatal ultrasound scans. And I think that the um, viability scan and dating scans, they were pretty easy or, or fairly straightforward, and most of us understand where they sit. But the nuchal translucency scan, the non-invasive prenatal test has sort of come out, its price is call, falling. It's the most accurate way now that we have to diagnose Down syndrome. So really, is there a space for nuchal translucencies or first trimester combined screens where we add the PAPA-A and the beta-HCG anymore, or should we just skip those and go straight to the morphology scan at 18 to 20 weeks? Well, Wendy, I think that's a really important question because there's a lot of confusion in the community about this very topic. Yes, indeed, uh, the NIPT study is the most sensitive and has the lowest false positive rate of any of the screening tests that we have available at the moment. So if a patient can afford it and it specifically wants to exclude the risk of Down syndrome, it has a sensitivity of about 98 to 99% and a low false positive rate. However, and this is the big point, mm -hmm. however, it is only really um, predominantly screening for trisomy 21. And we've been doing nuchal translucencies for nearly 20 years. And by far the large number of abnormalities we find, very few of them are actually Down syndrome. We actually diagnose a lot of other abnormalities which are not diagnosed on the NIPT study. So we diagnose things like anencephaly, and we just don't want to see an anencephalic appear at 20 weeks gestation. It becomes very traumatic for the patient. We diagnose on fellow seals, gastroschisis, um, a variety of genetic syndromes, uh, or even just get an idea of a pregnancy, which may be at risk. We may not know what it is, but it could be a risk of IUGR late in pregnancy due to the low PAP A. Mm -hmm. It could be other things, and it helps us to triage the patient, I think, for its further obstetric care into low risk or high risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, one of the issues, of course, women making choices in how they spend their money. Um, so, cost comes into this. So, I know from ringing around uh, radiology practices here in South um, Brisbane, that the cost for a nuchal translucency varies from a, a low that I can find of about $180 up to a high of more than $300, with the average probably sitting about $220. Medicare rebates? Uh, there is a Medicare rebate available for the nuchal translucency uh, mm -hmm. study, but it's very important for GPs to understand that they completely control whether or not the patient gets a Medicare rebate. So the way that the request uh, is written out indicates to us whether they feel that this patient deserves a Medicare rebate. The schedule has actually been written with a very broad range of qualifying um, conditions which would qualify a patient for a rebate. Uh, this includes the most simple thing of all, which is to exclude the risk of fetal anomaly. So if the GP indicates that, that they want their patient to get a rebate, um, if they just write some clinical information such as exclude risk of fetal anomaly, they will get the Medicare rebate. At this stage, there is no rebate for the NIPT study. So the Medicare rebate is $60. Does that cover your costs? Um, it's a very intense and sophisticated study. We're looking at a baby that is you know, five centimetres long, you know, the size of my finger, and we're basically doing a lot of the morphology that we used to only do at 18 to 20 weeks gestation. In particular, we're looking quite closely at the uh, developing brain, uh, the ventricles, the posterior fossa. Mm -hmm. We look even at the heart because there's times when we can identify a baby that's at high risk of a major cardiac anomaly. And we always diagnose cases of anencephaly, uh, omphalocele, gastroschisis. And I think it is most important to be able to diagnose those towards the end of that first trimester rather than later, much later in the pregnancy. When patients are always already experiencing movements and it's all more difficult to deal with. I just want to make one point too is that um, obviously the closer we get to 13 weeks, dramatic increase in development has occurred. So although we can do the nuchal study from 11 weeks, two days, or 45 millimeter crown rod length, in that one week between 11 to 12 weeks to 13 weeks, nearly all of the neural uh, a large amount of further anatomy has formed. And so the closer we get to the 13 weeks, the more anatomy and detail we can achieve. 
So Kerry, you've mentioned before um, that beyond what you can tell with the nuchal translucency, there's also information that we gather from the first trimester client scan, so the blood tests in terms of identifying babies who might be at risk. Can you take me a little bit further in that? Well, there's actually a whole uh, series of different combinations of what the blood results, so the MOM is standing for the multiples of the mean. So a normal, or somebody is about 50% um, on the 50th percentile has an MOM of one. Somebody who's on the 95th percentile often has an MOM of two. And someone who's on the fifth percentile a multiple of the mean of about 0.3. So that shows the extremity or the of ranges um, from, with one being the mm -hmm. most normal. Mm -hmm. PAP-A is produced from the placenta. So if you have a very low uh, PAP-A level, it can indicate that there's a problem with the placenta and this can be associated with um, intrauterine growth restriction in the third trimester and it can trigger us to watch some of these pregnancies a little bit closer and certainly not to let them go uh, over term. The other thing that I think you'll see dr develop dramatically in the next mm -hmm. five years is the role of the first trimester scan or this nuchal scan in the prediction of patients at high risk of preeclampsia mm -hmm. um, or preterm labour. Now, with the introduction of morphology scanning and ultrasound scanning, we've been able to reduce the number of anomalies uh, diagnosed, but we haven't particularly yet changed the stillbirth or later complications, mm -hmm. particularly of preeclampsia. And that's where the next focus is going to be on, and there's a lot of research looking at um, the assessment of the uterine artery dopplers, the PAPA level, placental growth factor, with um, the nuchal translucency study to identify those ladies at high risk of preeclampsia. It can get confusing um, for GPs when you read a report. So for example, if we get a first trimester combined screen with a risk of a trisomy 21, say, of 1 in 298, but a negative nipped, what are we to do with that? Well, ideally, I would recommend that you and you are seeing your patient in discussing these options, and yes, they do want to have both tests. I would get them to have the referral for both, to have their bloods done um, three to five days before their ultrasound appointment, and they could have the blood taken for the NIPT at exactly the same time. Come and have their scan, and then once they have their ultrasound scan, say, oh, well, it's come up slightly high risk for trisomy 21. Let's look at your NIPT results. NIPT shows low risk for trisomy 21, so we don't have to worry about trisomy 21. There might be something else that we'll just keep an eye on and we'll look at closely. So, for instance, it may have come up high risk because the actual nuchal measurement is over three millimeters, mm -hmm. which is over the 95th percentile, and that can be a sign to us of uh, cardiac anomalies or other abnormalities, and we would do a detailed fetal echo at the 18 week scan. So there's still a lot to be gained from that nuchal study. And Kerry, you refer to the nuchal translucency scan, but as an um, ordering uh, GP, should I be asking for a nuchal translucency scan or should I be ordering first trimester combined screen where I understand that's blood plus nuchal? I think um, we should continue doing the first trimester combined screen as you have been doing because I do think that there is also other aspects of the bloods which can help and which is where we're going to see great advances in mm -hmm. the future uh, in looking at the PAPA level for risk of preterm, uh, late, well for preeclampsia and there are other things from the bloods which also add in to the whole scenario that make us uh, more aware of certain things to watch for. We particularly looking for um, placental growth um, uh, in the third trimester, intrauterine growth re uh, restriction, etc. So, from your perspective, you'll be doing a nuchal translucency scan. From my perspective, I'll be ordering that plus the bloods to be done three to five days beforehand. Does it matter if I call it a nuchal translucency or can I call it a 12 week scan? No, this is a really important point, and I'm very glad you've brought that mm -hmm. up because since the NIPT, we're starting to see an explosion of patients coming just for a 12-week scan, not a nuchal. They must understand that um, a 12-week scan is a very basic scan that may be interpreted as just a dating type scan from a scheduling perspective. A nuchal study requires a tremendously more sophisticated study with a higher level of qualification and we have much um, higher um, qualifications and auditoring of nuchal studies. 
So as I say, in that nuchal study, you will get a very detailed anatomical study. And we're looking at something that's only five to six centimetres long. So we need sophisticated equipment. We need sophisticated sonographers. And we have a great deal of audit um, in this study. So everyone who does a nuchal scan has to be accredited. They have to um, achieve higher qualification with a theoretical test, a practical test. And we all have to participate in audit where we have to have our images submitted and analysed. So this is actually, I mean, from the patient perspective, a wonderful step forward because this is the only area of radiology really where we're personally analysed in everything we do and the quality of our images. So from a quality um, as, um, assurance perspective, you're getting a very high standard scan and you won't get that with just requiring or ordering a 12 week scan. So as a GP, I'm quite familiar with the importance of my front desk booking the appropriate time and space for me to do what needs to be done. So what I'm hearing is that it really does matter. If I put nuchal, your reception staff, your booking staff will know to book in the appropriate scan with the appropriately trained um, sonographer. And the appropriate time. And yes. the appropriate time to be allowed. If I order a 12-week uh, scan, effectively, it's just going to be like a daily scan. I won't get that detailed anatomical scan that gives the information that then allows parents to make decisions at an earlier stage than what otherwise might have been. Absolutely, possible. and you must remember that even if the patient has had an NIPT study, we do still measure the nuchal translucency because if it is greater than three millimetres, as I said, it can indicate a cardiac anomaly or other cause, not trisomy 21. Okay. So it is also still classifying the pregnancy to high or low risk. So Kerry, it's May 2018. I'm now postgraduate year 31. <laughs> Okay, when I graduated, are you kidding me? Ultrasound scans looked like the interference pattern on a black and white TV. Can you please maybe share with us some of the images and show us how amazing this technology is now? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be yeah. delighted. Okay, so Kerry, thank you so much. Uh, we are sharing this case with permission and have attempted to de-identify anything. Our apologies if we've missed something. Kerry, take us through. Okay, so here's a baby at um, 13 weeks of gestation. Um, it measures seven centimetres in length. And we actually go through this um, with tremendous detail into the anatomy. We can see the nasal bone here. Um, we can measure the length. Now this is what I was saying, this baby is now 13 weeks. And by the time we get to 13 weeks, we can see tremendous uh, detail. This is beautiful image in the sagittal section, which is actually where we're measuring the nuchal translucency. And we're also now looking at the development of the posterior fossa, so we can see the brain stem. This is what's called the intracranial translucency, which is essentially the fourth ventricle and the cisterna magna. So this is what we're looking at uh, for early signs of spider bifida, which has been a tremendous advance in the last couple of years. This is um, another image. We often take a cine loop through the baby's brain. So this is starting at the top of the brain. We can see that the skull's ossified, so we don't have any signs of anencephaly um, as we go down, we see the chorate plexus forming within the lateral ventricles. We can see the lateral and medial wall of the ventricle. Coming down, we can see where the vornices are forming and later to form the cavum septum pellucidum, um, which at the 18-week scan, we'll be looking for any signs of agenesis of the corpus callosum. We see the third ventricle and we come down it through the posterior fossa to the uh, brainstem. I'm just going to bring one other image in which is a little bit nicer showing this. Um, so coming down here we can see the thalamus. Here's the aqueduct of Sylvius which leads down into the fourth ventricle and then we see the chorae plexus in the fourth ventricle. Uh, as we go through the baby we're looking at quite marked details of the heart. We can actually get a four chamber view of the heart and basic outflow tracts. We look for the position of the stomach, the integrity of the anterior abdominal wall. So we diagnose things like gastroschisis and omphalocele. Omphaloceles can also be associated with chromosomal abnormalities. Um, the, uh, this is a 3D or 4D image of the baby. So we're really getting quite tremendous and beautiful anatomy at this early stage.